So I received a comment asking if I could throw in some tips and tricks for looking for through archives. I want to start searching and I have no idea where to start. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to share a couple of resources that I find very useful, but also continue this topic on how the 19th century structures were very possible for the Victorians and how they went up so quickly. When it comes to the 19th century, one of the best resources are the journals, magazines and catalogues of the time. In the 1800s, there were multiple journal publications in circulation dedicated to building, construction, engineering and architecture, such as Builder, the Civil Engineer and Architects Journal and the Architectural Magazine in England. And in North America, you have journals like the Brick Builder, the Canadian Architect and Builder. In Australia, you have ones like the Victorian Contractors and Builders Price Book. I got a lot of clarity by looking through these kind of documents. They have articles, pricing on materials, tenders, current competitions, advertisements, job adverts. The English ones even have coverage on construction news from America Australia and other nations. There is so much. And one of the most interesting things I have come across in these is the booming market of artificial stone in the 19th century. I spoke about the artificial code stone in this episode and how it is basically a clay-like substance that was set in moulds. It sets harder than stone and will outlast any real limestone. But there was a lot of other stuff going on in the 19th century. And what's interesting is that as I was digging around, I came to realise that there were treaties published in the 1700s on artificial stone. Such as this one, published in 1730 by Richard Holt. A short treatise of artificial stone, as tis now made and converted into all manner of curious embellishments and proper ornaments of architecture. He kept his formula secret but said he could control the strength of the stone and actually manufactured it in London. In 1770, another artificial stone manufacturer, Daniel Pincott, published an essay on the origins, nature, use and properties of artificial stone. So it's officially documented that they were making artificial stone before the 19th century. By the time we get to the 1800s, it's a full-blown business and actually making up most of the architectural decoration and sculpture across England. We have Austin and Seeley selling moulded and cast artificial stone pieces in bulk. We have Blanchard's artificial stonework and terracotta. And it's all over the country, in the big stately manors and gardens. All the statues, fountains, Ornamentation on all these classical structures and big manor estates are artificial stone that has been moulded and cast. You can see here in these decorative pieces that the outer layer has worn away to reveal a terracotta base. Terracotta is made from a malleable clay and can be moulded very easily. And they used it everywhere, from whole buildings to decorative ornaments. This list published in 1869 documents all the terracotta and code stone that just one of these companies have made for structures in England so far. They've even shipped to parts of America. Austin's Artificial Stoneworks was an established business in 1835. It specialised in ornamental statues, fish ponds, globes, sundials, but also artificial grottos, fake rock works and imitative ruins. Madeira Walk in Ramsgate is an example of fake rock works made from cement and rubble. It's called Poemite Stone and the Victorians used it a lot. A 
and Austin's artificial stone company was just one of the companies producing and designing this stuff. And they had been doing it well before 1835 at the time of this catalogue. As it states, the superiority of Austin's artificial stone is now so firmly established that the most eminent architects and scientific gentlemen have expressed, in the highest terms, their approbation of its durability and close resemblance to real stone. This is an Australian price catalogue published in 1859 and it shows just how much the Victorian industry of construction had spread in Melbourne and its surroundings. The document features over 45 pages of business advertisements, iron and brass founders, steam brickworks, machine agents specialising in steam engines and pumps, marble and stonemasons, blacksmiths, and look, there are ones for artificial stone. This one, silicious stone, is the most perfect substitute for natural stone. You can get all kinds of prefab moulded items, from rusticated ashlar to gothic tracery, corbels, screens, pulpits, fonts for churches, even arms and crests set into panels. The document lists prices and measurements for all kinds of different cement, Portland cement, marble cement or scagliola, modelling and casting of Corinthian capitals. Under the cements it says that the whole of the above goods being direct importations from the manufacturers Dalton & Co of London, Liverpool, Birmingham, Staffordshire and at a cheap rate. This was published in 1858. Melbourne was not just a handful of convicts. Until the gold rush in 1851, most of Melbourne was built of timber. And it was the gold rush that sent the population and its industry soaring. And that's when all this growth happened. You can see in this document just how established the area is becoming by 1858. It has marble manufacturers selling chimney pieces and Victoria quarries selling freestone. And freestone is very interesting. In my last video I spoke about the stone cutting machines of the Industrial Revolution. I'm not sure if you got a chance to look through the documents, especially the ones detailing George Hunter machines, but they were put into practice and some of them were quite big. In the 1840s and into the 50s, several stone working machines had come into general use. By the 1860s, they were suitably massive and cut into a depth of 2 foot 9 inches per minute. And if you look in the Powers catalogue, it says that they are most suited for freestones and sandstones. Freestone is named such because it can be freely cut in any direction. It is a great stone for moulding and tracery. In the south of England there is a particular type of freestone called bath stone. It is a very soft limestone and you can see here that it is soft enough to be sawed by hand. This is a stone that the town of Bath is made from. It's all over South England, and while the structures of Bath, like the Royal Crescent, look impressive from the front, they are just facades. The buildings beyond the facades are actually made from rubble brick. America has its freestone too. You have Hummelstown, brownstone of Pennsylvania. It produces this unique purplish colour and was used in the construction of these buildings. And the Hummelstown quarries have machine saws too. Existing records do not mention the specific saw that was used in the early years of the business, but from 1875 on, it was a stone cutting saw patented by Andrews T. Merriman of Cook County, Illinois. The principle consists simply of a smooth flat blade of soft iron, set in a frame and fed with sharp sand and water. The saws now frequently set in gangs of a dozen or more in a single frame and several gangs are tended by one man who shovels on wet sand as needed, while fine streams of water from overhead wash it beneath the blade as it swings backward and forward in its slowly deepening groove. 
In fact, America had steam-powered stonecutters and machines quite early on. It's all in these journals. An 1876 edition of Scientific American Journal even presented patent diagrams for diamond stone saws. This can all be found at quarriesandbeyond.org, and I'll leave a link below. This doesn't mean, however, that they could not quarry and carve harder stone. They could do all of this by hand, but the machines sped up the process considerably. And they moved all this stone around via a whole range of different methods. They had carts on site. They used a multitude of different cranes, and then later on, steam cranes. They use horse, cattle and cars. If the quarry was uphill, then they'd have a horse pull these carts to the top load the stones and use a downward force and brake control to get the stone to the ports or stations. Railways in America and England started earlier than in Australia, but by the 1850s all three nations were seeing an expansion of the steam locomotive. Trains transported huge blocks from quarries and to ports where cranes would load onto ships. Not only that, but in some places they also had steam trucks with traction engines. In England there was a policy in place that banned steam trucks for personal use. The Victorians rode around on horse and car. They kept it classy, but they also had powerful steam technology and machines. The traction engines were only used for the transportation of goods and building materials, but they did exist. These are some of the main reasons why it was all possible in the 19th century, and why it happened very quickly. Because the Industrial Revolution connected everything with railways and ships, the traditional quarrying, construction, and stonemason methods became a lot faster through steam technology, and because there was an absolute booming market of pseudo-stonemasonry, or artificial stone. The Victorians didn't inherit everything, they made a lot of it. Information in these documents is not plastered all over Wikipedia. For the most part, it's fallen slightly into obscurity, and you will likely say that they can't be trusted. But they do align with what I'm seeing in person when visiting these sites. Artificial stone everywhere. The mark of the Industrial Revolution, everywhere. So yeah, 19th century journals, catalogues and magazines have been a great resource for me to wrap my head around a lot of this. In the next video I'm going to present a related, but in some ways better research resource. I will then outline why, for me, understanding and accepting that the architecture is very possible to build unlocks a whole different approach to tackling corrupted history. I'll do this in a couple of videos time. Until then, keep well and have a good day.